I'm Kerry Cullen, EC, the director of the Penn Program on Regulation and a professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. This lecture series on race and regulation focuses on the most important task for every society, ensuring equal justice and dignity and respect to all people. Today's lecture, Board Diversity Matters, an empirical assessment of community lending at Federal Reserve regulated banks is by Brian Feinstein of the Wharton School. Professor Feinstein is a political scientist and a lawyer. His work covers a wide range of financial regulation and administrative law issues. And he's published in the leading uh, law journals and, and empirical journals uh, in uh, the field of, of law. Uh, before joining the Wharton School, uh, Professor Feinstein taught at the University of Chicago Law School, and prior to that, he practiced law and served as outside counsel to the Federal Housing Finance Agency and also clerked on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. His lecture today draws on work joint with Peter Conti Brown of the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School as well as with Caleb Nygaard of Yale University. It also connects in its way with two lectures we held in the fall semester. So any of you who have been following our lecture series throughout the year, uh, or who would like to catch up by watching the videos of the fall lectures on our YouTube channel, may see a connection between one lecture by Jessica Traunstein of the University of California Merced, a political scientist who focused on discrimination in housing markets and redlining. Today's lecture uh, builds on research uh, using data produced in response to federal legal requirements adopted designed to combat redlining and other discrimination in the bank uh, lending markets for housing. A second lecture from the fall was delivered by Chris Brummer of Georgetown Law School, who spoke about the lack of black political leadership in federal financial regulatory bodies. This lack of black leadership mattered, Professor Brummer argued, because policy depends ultimately on who is in the room where it happens, to quote from the musical Hamilton. And today's lecture seeks in its way to test the room where it happens hypothesis and see what difference diversity makes within uh, the structures of regulatory bodies. This is important not only because of who sits in regulatory agencies and what difference that makes for policy, but also because there are regulations such as those in the state of California that have sometime imposed requirements on private corporate boards to have diverse membership. So today's lecture is timely, important, and it speaks to issues of great concern uh, for the field of regulation and for racial justice. Today's lecture is co-sponsored by the Wharton Initiative on Financial Policy and Regulation as well as our partner for the entire lecture series, the University of Pennsylvania Law School's Office on Equity and Inclusion. Now, after the conclusion of uh, Professor Feinstein's lecture today, uh, we should have an opportunity for questions from the audience. To submit your questions, please simply click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I'll be able to see your questions and we'll then draw from them and ask questions of Professor Feinstein. I, and I'll strive my very best to get through as many of them as time allows. Uh, speaking of time, without any further ado, it is time and it's my distinct privilege to turn the screen over to Professor Brian Feinstein talking about why board diversity matters. Brian? Well, thank you so much, Carrie, uh, for your kind introduction. Uh, I was so pleased to learn in September that the Penn Program on Regulation would be convening this lecture series on race and regulation. Uh, the program under your leadership is, is such a leading light uh, for practitioners and academics. And uh, so I really appreciated the decision to spotlight this important topic. Uh, 
I've learned so much uh, from the speakers in the series, and I'm really honored uh, to be invited to present this work. I also thank, as you mentioned, the Penn Law Office of Equity and Inclusion and the Wharton Initiative on Financial Policy and Regulation uh, for co-sponsoring this event. Uh, as Carrie mentioned, uh, the title of my talk is Board Diversity Matters, uh, and it draws on empirical research that I conducted alongside uh, my colleague Peter Conti Brown and Caleb Nygaard. Uh, the project basically has its origins in two observations. Uh, the first is that African Americans' access to the financial system is considerably more precarious than that of other Americans. And the second observation, uh, which Carrie, as you highlighted, draws on research that Professor Chris Brummer presented as part of this lecture series, is that there's a real dearth of Black financial regulators. My co-authors and I wondered if those observations are connected. And if the number of minorities in leadership positions, if it increases, whether we would see a corresponding increase in access to financial services for minority borrowers. Uh, the leadership positions that we examine here are the boards of directors of the 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks. Uh, these are entities that regulate and supervise many, but not all, uh, commercial banks within their geographical regions. Uh, we measure access to financial services using bank scores on regulators' exams under the Community Reinvestment Act, or CRA. Uh, the CRA requires that banks lend to underserved communities, often majority minority communities, within each bank's lending area. And the CRA penalizes banks uh, that don't meet this obligation. Now, to preview our results, we find that diversity does matter, that banks that are supervised and regulated by Federal Reserve Banks with more Black and Hispanic leaders tend to engage in greater CRA lending and greater lending to these underserved minority communities. I'll begin with a brief overview of the talk. So first I'm gonna describe the racial disparities that we see in access to financial services and explain how the CRA is designed to mitigate some of these disparities. Second, I'll explain how the 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks assess many commercial banks' compliance with the CRA and how uh, the Federal Reserve's unique structure allows us to isolate the independent effects of regulator diversity on CRA lending. Third, I'll present our results. In brief, uh, we find across a wide variety of statistical models that there's strong evidence that as the share of Black and Hispanic leaders of the relevant regional Federal Reserve Bank increases, the propensity of regulated banks within that region to lend to underserved communities also increases. And then finally, I'll conclude uh, with some recommendations regarding how this finding that regulator diversity matters for lending outcomes can be put to use across a, a wide variety of administrative agencies. So starting with racial disparities in lending, um, th these racial uh, gaps in banking are severe. About 20% of black households are what's called unbanked meaning no member of the household has access, uh, rather possesses a, a basic checking or savings account. You can compare that 20% uh, rate of unbanked African-Americans uh, to a rate of around 4% of white households that are unbanked. African-Americans pay much higher rates for mortgages and other loans, especially auto loans. They pay higher fees for basic banking services uh, like checking accounts. Um, and that's when they're able to access a bank there's a much higher proportion of African-Americans that live in what are called banking deserts, where there's no uh, brick and mortar uh, branch of a bank that's nearby. African-Americans are also more likely to be foreclosed upon and sued by creditors. And all of these disparities persist when one controls for factors like income uh, and credit score. Now, Congress passed the uh, Community Reinvestment Act in 1977 and significantly amended it several times thereafter to help redress some of these disparities. Its passage was, you can consider it the culmination of a series of uh, anti-discrimination laws related to housing finance. So I place, for instance, the Fair Housing Act of 1968, um, passed as part of the Civil Rights Act of that year uh, in that group, as well as the Equal Credit Opportunity Act of 1974, uh, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act also of 1974, but the CRA goes further than those other laws that prohibit discrimination. 
CRA uh, affirmatively compels banks to extend for-profit lending into underserved communities. The law requires that federal banking regulators, like the Federal Reserve, periodically evaluate regulated banks and assign them a score based in large part on their record of lending to these underserved communities. Poor performance on CRA exams could inhibit banks' ability to expand, uh, either by opening more branches or through merger or acquisition. Now, formally, uh, the law is race neutral. It speaks of lending to underserved communities within the bank's uh, uh, geographic region. Um, its preamble states that its purpose is to encourage lenders to help meet the credit needs of the local communities in which they're chartered. Nonetheless, the CRA was seen at the time and continues to be seen as a piece with other civil rights laws, redressing some of the wrongs that were made possible uh, by government promoted racial, racial uh, redlining, uh, as uh, Jessica Traumstein uh, discussed in an earlier lecture in the series. Uh, and um, for those of you that, that uh, didn't attend um, Professor Traumstein's lecture or are unfamiliar with the term, redlining is essentially the practice of uh, curtailing credit to neighborhoods uh, that are seen uh, as high risk, with that supposed risk uh, closely correlated and erroneously uh, correlated, um, correlated based on racist premises uh, with the prevalence of African-American residents in the neighborhood. The CRA was designed to serve uh, an anti-subordination function uh, to affirmatively redress that sort of race-based discriminatory underinvestment in minority neighborhoods. Uh, since its inception, that mission has proved to be controversial. If the statute's working well, uh, by definition, it's gonna lead banks to make loans uh, that they otherwise wouldn't make. So some critics say that it therefore encourages risky lending uh, and leads to defaults. Other critics say the CRA does too little because the law is vague and it's arbitrarily enforced or because it's too easy for banks to get a passing grade. In fact, uh, uh, Professor Conti Brown and I are working on another article uh, making that argument, uh, looking at grade inflation in the CRA. But regardless of whether one thinks the CRA works well or not, um, and for those in the latter camp, whether regardless of whether one thinks the CRA should be strengthened or whether it should be weakened, uh, those debates are mostly irrelevant to this project. Study after study has shown that the law has in fact spurred access to credit among minority borrowers and low-income borrowers. So whatever else uh, the CRA may accomplish, it certainly does boost credit to those populations. CRA exams are administered by a patchwork of federal regulators. Um, for purposes of this study, uh, what's important is that the Federal Reserve regulates state chartered banks that are members of the Federal Reserve System. So not every bank, uh, but, but certainly many. Uh, JP Morgan Chase comes to mind as the largest of these banks that the Fed regulates. Uh, the group also includes what you'd call uh, the large uh, regional banks. So think of SunTrust in the South or Bank of New York Mellon in New York or Northern Trust and Fifth Third in the Midwest. Um, for other banks like nationally chartered banks, uh, state chartered savings banks and the like, there are other federal reg regulators that conduct these exams. And essentially what the exams involve is agency personnel opening up the bank's books and assigning a score on a four point scale. Uh, although in practice around 80% of banks receive a score of uh, satisfactory and another 14% are rated outstanding uh, on these exams. Now for the banks that are regulated by the Fed, uh, they're conducted by personnel in each of the 12 regional uh, Federal Reserve Banks. The Federal Reserve System has a complex structure, uh, but for our purposes, what's important is that bank regulation and supervision, including these CRA exams, is performed at the regional level by these 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks. So for instance, uh, the Philadelphia Fed, uh, just down the road uh, from me, uh, examines banks that are headquartered in Eastern and Central Pennsylvania, in Southern New Jersey, and throughout Delaware. CRA examiners at the Philadelphia Fed are responsive to the Philly Fed's president. Uh, they're not civil servants. They don't have civil service protection. They're more akin to corporate employees with the Philly Fed president being their CEO. Um, and uh, the Philly Fed president, in turn, is responsive to a nine-member board of directors, much like a corporate CEO is responsive to a board. Uh, the board selects the president, the vice president, and other senior managers. And the board also has the power to remove these folks uh, if it chooses to do so. 
So the board has this indirect influence over the rigor of CRA exams um, through the board's control of the president and other key officials uh, at the bank, at the Federal Reserve Bank. And therefore, in theory, the board can also influence banks lending to underserved communities uh, through that, that chain. But boards also have direct influence over CRA examiners. The board can directly appoint and remove any reserve bank officer or employee. And there are instances where the board bypasses the reserve bank president and directly hires the official that's in charge of conducting CRA exams. Uh, because the board can legally appoint and remove not only officers, but also employees, the board technically has direct control over line level CRA examiners. Now in practice, the, the Federal Reserve Bank's boards of directors rarely exercise that power. Uh, the boards rarely reach down into the Federal Reserve Bank's org chart uh, to hire or remove a, a low level employee. But the board could do so if it wants to. It has the legal power to do it. Uh, and that fact may motivate lower level employees like the line level CRA examiners to be responsive to the board of directors priorities. And finally, a Federal Reserve Bank's board of directors may be able to directly influence bank executives. These Federal Reserve Bank boards of directors are comprised of local notables from the region's economic and civic elites. They hobnob with the CEOs of the banks that are headquartered in their regions. They may be able to exercise soft power, I call it the power of persuasion, to affect those regulated banks' lending decisions. To the extent that these local notables who are on the board personally know or encounter bank executives, they may impart to them the importance of community lending or alternatively not do so. So taken together, these uh, three channels of influence present substantial and meaningful levers for a Federal Reserve Bank Board of Directors to pull in order to influence Reserve Bank supervisory posture. Under the uncontroversial assumption that regulated banks respond to their regulator, we posit that the composition of a Reserve Bank Board of Directors uh, and thus its supervisory priorities will influence lending activity of regulated banks. So that connection between the Reserve Bank Boards of Directors and commercial banks CRA lending is what motivates our hypothesis, that diversity at the top in the composition of the boards of directors of these 12 Federal Reserve Banks affects the behavior of bank supervisors down the chain, and thus ultimately affects the behavior of regulated banks. Basically, if you're a bank executive and you think your regulator cares a lot about lending to underserved communities, you're gonna care more about lending to underserved communities. And if you think it's a low priority for your regulator, it's likely to be a low priority for you as well. We use a basic regression framework to test this. Uh, the key independent variable is the number of black and Hispanic directors on a given Federal Reserve Bank's board of directors. And the dependent variable is the CRA scores of Fed regulated banks in that reserve bank's region. Now, the problem with this setup is that there's many factors that can presumably affect CRA lender, lending. Um, how can we control for all of these factors? Call them uh, confounding variables. So there's gonna be different state regulation, different local economic condition, uh, the views and priorities of the workforce in a region. All of that is gonna affect presumably uh, lending to low uh, income and underserved communities as well. How can we control for all of that and isolate the independent effects of regulator diversity on CRA lending? Well, well, here's the solution. The jurisdictional boundaries of the regional Federal Reserve Banks um, offer a way forward here. So you'll, you'll recall that I mentioned that the Philadelphia Fed conducts CRA evaluations for banks, for instance, in Southern New Jersey. Well, the Northern half of New Jersey is in the New York Fed's turf. So if we compare CRA lending for banks that are in Southern New Jersey uh, to CRA lending for banks in, other, in, in Northern New Jersey, we've managed to control essentially for uh, state regulation. Going further, if we, if we compare banks, uh, CRA lending for banks that are just north of that dividing line between the Philly Fed and the New York Fed, so somewhere in central New Jersey where that division is, if we compare banks that are right on the Northern side of that border with banks that are on the Southern side of the border, you have the same economic conditions, uh, the same workforce and the same regional culture, 
as well as the same state regulation. The only difference is which Federal Reserve Bank supervises and uh, regulates them. Um, so it's not just New Jersey, uh, by the way. There's 11 other states uh, that are bifurcated into two Federal Reserve districts. So there's some large population states in this group. Uh, think Illinois, uh, Pennsylvania, Missouri, Wisconsin, and so on. And so we focus on these states. And in some analyses, we focus on the border region, where there's a Federal Reserve District boundary in the middle of the state. W what's the lender on one side of that border doing compared to the lender on the other side? Um, in other words, the bottom line here is that the patchwork na uh, nature of uh, federal enforcement of the CRA allows us to make this comparison, to compare CRA lending in areas uh, where banks are faced with a racially diverse regulator to CRA lending in areas where banks face a non-diverse regulator uh, and where those areas are otherwise substantially similar, but for the presence or absence of minority board members. So you could think of this as a treatment group and a control group. And what we found was remarkable. For every additional African-American or Hispanic director on one of these regional Federal Reserve Bank's nine member boards, the probability that a bank within that regulator's jurisdiction receives a grade of outstanding on its CRA exam increases by about four percentage points. So if you go from zero minority directors to three minority directors, that's basically the low end to the high end of the distribution. And the probability that a regulated bank gets an outstanding rating uh, increases by almost 12 percentage points. By comparison, only approximately 14% of all banks in our sample receive an outstanding rating. So the size of that percentage point increase is really substantial. And by the way, that finding is uh, statistically significant. It's robust to a wide variety of model specifications and robustness checks. Happy to get into all that in Q&A if people would like. But the bottom line is that we're confident that we've observed a real and substantial effect. So what does this mean? I want to highlight four implications of this finding. So first and foremost, it shows that representation matters, that diversity matters. I mentioned Professor Brummer's lecture in this series on uh, the, the, the paucity of Black financial regulators. Some would argue that focusing on incremental increases in minority representation uh, in agency leadership is mere tokenism, that it's window dressing, and that it doesn't matter for outcomes. That's not the case, uh, at least not here. Even adding small numbers of non-white directors uh, who are never in the majority on a board and usually not even close, that still influences outcomes. I, I want to just um, pump the brakes here for a moment. Uh, so there's many ways in which diverse leadership can matter. We're showing just one way, uh, that it matters for these lending outcomes. But we also know that diversity can matter as well for myriad other ways that aren't captured by this analysis. For one, diverse organizations can reach uh, objectively better criteria. So there's research by my Wharton colleagues, uh, Stephanie Creary, uh, Mae McDonald, and others. And, and they find that directors on corporate boards that have collegial uh, egalitarian cultures tend to view board diversity as a business strength, as an asset. Drawing on social psychology, uh, Cass Sunstein and others, argue that ideological diversity encourages agencies to reach less extreme outcomes. There's studies of judicial decisions uh, that find that the impact of judges' ideologies or the partisanship of the president that appointed the judges is blunted when those judges sit on ideologically diverse panels. And, and there's nothing about these explanations from agencies and, and, and corporate boards and uh, judicial panels uh, that would make it limited to ideological diversity. Uh, there's diversity across a host of characteristics that may have a similar effect. As well, providing underrepresented groups with a seat at the table can encourage participation among members of those groups. So in Claudine Gay's studies of uh, minority members of Congress and in Jane uh, Mansbridge's studies of female uh, members of Congress, they find that having a representative who shares a meaningful trait with a constituent can encourage that constituent to reach out and participate completely divorced from the representative's substantive representation from their roll call record or their bills introduced, just uh, having that connection offers uh, what Manbridge and Gay and others call descriptive representation. 
It provides a signal to constituents that a government that looks like them on some dimension is more likely to be responsive to them. And so they engage. Now, I don't claim that Federal Reserve Bank directors are nearly as high profile as members of Congress, but they can still, in ways large and small, bring people into the governance process, encouraging participation uh, from groups that are underrepresented. Consider the experience of Michelle Bowman. Bowman is a member of the Federal Reserve's Board of Governors. Uh, that's another Fed governance structure. It's based in Washington, and it's distinct mostly uh, from these 12 regional Federal Reserve banks. I told you the Fed's governance structure is complex, and that's some of this complexity. Uh, but the, the important thing here is that uh, she's an important policymaker on the Fed's Board of Governors. And, and Bowman is a former community banker, uh, meaning an executive at a small bank. Uh, she, was, uh, she worked as an executive in a single branch bank in Council Grove, Kansas, population 2100. Um, and she then served as her state's banking commissioner and now serves on the Fed's Board of Governors. There aren't many uh, high-ranking Fed officials with Bowman's background. And she sees her role not only as representing community bank interests, but also as a conduit of information from community banks to the Fed and then uh, back to community banks again. Just pick up the phone, she likes to say when she speaks to community bank groups, and she tries to convey a sense of accessibility and informality that's rarely associated with the Fed. And she's not just um, transferring information from community banks to the Fed. Uh, as I mentioned, um, she's also taking information from the Fed to community banks, uh, speaking to community bank groups and writing in community bank trade publications frequently. She's trying to educate community bankers on the Fed's policies. And if you look at her tenure thus far, you see a real commitment to bringing community bank voices uh, to the table at the Fed. Um, and it may be that some community banks, by virtue of interacting with somebody whom, with whom they can identify, do participate more. One could imagine a Black or Hispanic leader on a regional Federal Reserve Bank uh, board playing a similar role engaging with and encouraging participation from minority civic or business groups uh, that traditionally aren't, um, aren't in the room where it happens, to, to quote Kerry quoting Chris, Chris Brummer, quoting Hamilton. Um, so to summarize, uh, the first implication of this research is that board diversity matters, uh, but our measure may just be capturing a floor, not a ceiling uh, regarding how it matters. Diverse decision makers can improve outcomes in subtle and perhaps immeasurable ways. And there are uh, real advantages to descriptive representation that likewise defy quantitative measurement and lie outside of the scope of, of our uh, more narrow findings. The second implication that I wanna highlight is that in addition to diverse, diversifying agency leadership, uh, policymakers ought to look at other ways to expand minority groups' seats at the table. Uh, so one way to do so would be to have specified seats designated for people with professional experience in community development or professional experience uh, regarding expanding access to credit for underserved communities. In fact, there are identity conscious representation requirements across the federal government. Uh, for instance, the head of the Department of Labor's Women's Bureau must be a woman. A majority of commissioners on the National Indian Gaming Commission must be enrolled members of a Native American tribe. Going further, um, there's a broad range of experiential requirements across the federal government. So I just mentioned Michelle Bowman. Uh, Congress passed a law in 2015 mandating that one seat on the Fed's Board of Governors uh, be for somebody with community bank experience. That's her. Uh, she's the one occupying that seat. Another example is the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Uh, that agency, by law, must include some commissioners that are knowledgeable in commodity production and merchandising. So think about farm products, agricultural products. And re requirements like that actually work. There have been CFTC commissioners who work at agriculture trade associations and farm credit banks. There have even been two actual farmers who have served as CFTC commissioners. And you can contrast that diverse composition of the CFTC with that of the SEC. Uh, it's an agency with similar turf, but without a similar representational requirement. As a consequence, over its history, nearly all SEC commissioners have been Wall Street lawyers or bankers. 
And indeed, there are representation requirements even within the Federal Reserve System. Uh, I, you know, I just mentioned uh, Michelle Bowman uh, sitting in the community bank seat. In addition, on each of the nine member uh, Federal Reserve Bank boards of directors, six of those members need to represent the public and the statute says, uh, quoting from the statute here, with consideration to the interests of agriculture, commerce, industry, services, labor, and consumers. And again, these statutory requirements are abided by. So why not expand them to include interests of historically underserved communities? Indeed, the whole structure of the Fed with its geographic divisions is premised on the assumption that identity matters in some ways, that geography in this case matters. When Congress passed the Federal Reserve Act in 1913, it included these geographic mandates to make sure that the central bank wasn't dominated by uh, New York-based bankers. Uh, I get it, uh, geography matters. But today, race matters too. And in the contemporary context, particularly concerning lending, I'd argue that someone's race matters a lot more than which region of the country they live in. I think the laws concerning these balance requirements should reflect that reality. Another way to increase minority group seats at the table is through advisory committees. These are groups of outside experts that regulatory agencies periodically convene. A good example of how these advisory committees work within the realm of financial regulation is the Office of Comptroller of the Currency's Minority Depository Institutions Advisory Committee. It's a group of executives and directors from minority-owned banks that meet several times a year to advise the controller of the currency. And by advise, I don't mean they write a report that he may or may not read. Uh, the controller actually attends their meetings, uh, sometimes day-long meetings. Now think about how valuable the controller's time is. How much, if it were possible, a bank lobbyist would pay to have an all-day meeting with the controller of the currency? It, it's inconceivable almost. So having this minority depositories institute, excuse me, minority depository institutions advisory committee operate as this sort of resource subsidy for an underrepresented group, um, you know, having the controller's ear with the controller spending his time actively engaged with them, um, it's valuable. And it also provides a signal to lower level OCC personnel that their leader views uh, diversity and in minority institutions as a priority. Regulators should think about expanding these sorts of offices across government. Yet another way to increase minority groups' seats at the table is through agency advocacy offices. 12 years ago, Congress recognized that uh, the views of ordinary investors weren't being heard sufficiently at the SEC. When the SEC, like any agency, endeavors to write a rule, it provides notice and then invites comments from the public. Well, as one would expect, the groups and people that are uh, best equipped to write sophisticated expert comments that are most likely to be useful to convey information and be useful, therefore, to the SEC tend to be well-resourced interests. There's less opportunity for a small-time investor to provide meaningful comments. So therefore, Congress created an Office of Investor Advocate at the SEC. Uh, and that office represents small investors in policymaking, and it has the resources, and that, that's really key, it has resources to provide um, small investors uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, expertise. Uh, let me rephrase that. It has the resources to, to provide um, uh, expert commentary uh, to SEC policymakers uh, that's grounded in the values and interests of small investors. So that basic concept an in-house advocacy office for stakeholders who have relatively fewer resources could be adopted to advance the interests of unbanked or underbanked groups at a variety of financial regulators. Third, there are implications here for corporate board diversity. It's often hard to measure the effects of diversity on outcomes because in many cases, there's no plausible control group. So let's say you're looking at Coca-Cola versus Pepsi. Let's say Coke has a diverse board, and let's just say Pepsi doesn't. Um, well, you can't really compare business outcomes at the two because even you know, these two cola companies, uh, they typically strive to differentiate themselves from each other. They operate uh, more in different re one region than the other. They have different product lines. They have different marketing campaigns. And these sorts of differences, even among corporations in the same 
basic business, stymie comparisons of the relationship between diversity and corporate outcomes. Simply put, the wide variety of differences among corporations, even those in the same industry, disrupts apples to apples comparisons of outcomes at diverse versus non-diverse corporations. And we see similar problems concerning a lack of an appropriate comparison group uh, with studies on diversity in legislatures or other government agencies. So if, if Congress is more diverse, uh, there's no control Congress, there's no, no like non-diverse legislature that does exactly the same thing Congress does that you can compare it to. And maybe you compare uh, the state legislatures, but each of those does different things. So I think there's a benefit here uh, to studying diversity in the context of the Federal Reserve Banks. All 12 Federal Reserve Banks are doing the exact same thing. They perform the exact same regulatory and supervisory functions. They just do so in different regions. And those regions cut across state lines. They cut across these political boundaries. And that makes the Federal Reserve System a good test case for the effects of diversity. That near equivalence is really rare among organizations. And it makes the Federal Reserve Banks exceptionally well suited to isolate and study the connections between board diversity and outcomes. So I think the conclusions from this study may be portable to the corporate context. Maybe we can't look at diversity at Coca-Cola versus Pepsi and draw strong inferences. But given the similarities between Federal Reserve Bank boards of directors and corporate boards of directors, maybe some of these lessons translate. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve Bank boards of directors do look a lot like corporate boards, as I alluded to earlier. These are part-time positions. Uh, members tend to be a mix of business people, folks from NGOs and civic leaders. And the Federal Reserve Banks are public-private partnerships. So there's a private sector uh, element here. Uh, some people doubt the ability of, um, of uh, part-time corporate boards to meaningfully influence large complex organizations. Uh, but our findings call that critique into question. If diversity on Federal Reserve Bank boards matters, uh, and these Federal Reserve Bank boards have so many characteristics in common with corporate boards, it seems reasonable uh, to, to wonder, uh, and perhaps even to assume, that diversity in a wide variety of leadership settings may matter as well. And finally, um, the final implication I want to mention is that our finding that diversity among these Federal Reserve Bank boards of directors matters, uh, that diversity at the top matters, raises the possibility that diversity among actors closer to the ground matters too, uh, perhaps even more so. Boards of directors, both for the Fed and for corporations, sometimes have only a tenuous connection to on the ground activity. Uh, I laid out several pathways through which the Federal Reserve Bank boards can influence um, CRA examiners, but these are pathways with, with several uh, nodes intervening. Um, if even these actors, even these reserve bank boards, where the, the causal connection between board diversity and commercial bank lending is somewhat attenuated, if even diversity matters there, um, uh, what about the presence of a Black or Hispanic bank supervisor who's physically present in the commercial bank? Uh, couldn't that matter uh, even more? And, and I think that's a really uh, interesting and potentially fruitful avenue for future research. Uh, so I think that's also an appropriate place to leave it for today. And I'm welcoming, um, I really welcome uh, Carrie and everyone's questions and comments. So thanks so much. Thank you very much, Brian. That was a really terrific uh, and informative presentation about issues that, as uh, you indicated, uh, connect up with so much of our thinking about regulation and its relationship with racial justice. So thank you very much for your work uh, that you're doing in this area and for sharing it with us. I wanted to start with just a, a, a kind of a question about the importance of law versus the importance of people. You know, you're a lawyer uh, here at, you know, Penn Law and the Penn Program and Regulation, we spend a lot of time on thinking what the rules are. And that's one way that one could think about achieving goals of racial justice is to get the rules right to offset and correct for systemic raci racism. And, and as you indicated, the Community Reinvestment Act is in some you know, measure motivated by 
uh, by that kind of desire, getting the rules right. If we can get the law working, uh, we, can, we can get more equitable outcomes. But what your research here at least suggests is that maybe in addition to, or even more so than getting the rules right, we need to get the right people, a diverse people. We need to have racial justice and racial equity in the leadership of organizations uh, that are, are engaged in regulatory functions. And, and not, not certainly, because these Fed, the Fed banks that had non-diverse uh, uh, boards were operating with the same rules, right? Uh, but when we had uh, the right kind of diversity in the, the ranks of the leadership, that's when you started to see uh, an increase uh, in, in this uh, excellence uh, and the Community Reinvestment Act scoring. So which is it? Is it law? Is it people? Well, that, thanks for that great question, Carrie. And I, you're right to point out I am a lawyer, but I'm also a professor at a business school where we like to think uh, that personnel matters. So I'm, I'm, there's some cognitive dissonance for me here. Um, I, I think, uh, I mean, I don't want to punch on your question, but um, you, you really do need uh, laws of foundation and uh, uh, diverse people um, uh, building upon that. Um, so the Community Reinvestment Act, kind of a, a, a law that grants a lot of discretion to uh, on-the-ground examiners. The original CRA, as passed in 1977, is one page long. Uh, today, it, it's, a, it's a bit longer, um, but uh, really uh, what one might call uh, guidance or, or a delegation uh, of pretty substantial discretion uh, to agents in the, uh, in the federal uh, regulatory agencies that, that regulate the financial institutions. So given that grant of discretion, um, you really do see, uh, as you mentioned, this wide uh, divergence um, in, in outcomes based on personnel. Um, I think if, uh, if one wants to see greater uh, lending to underserved communities, uh, one would be wise to focus on uh, increasing diversity in these Federal Reserve Banks, uh, rather than if one has to choose, rather than legal changes. Um, the CRA has been tinkered with many, many times uh, over the past uh, 40 some years. Um, uh, it, it's, it, it looks like the prospects for um, increasing or rather uh, strengthening it uh, are rather dim these days. Uh, by contrast, uh, we seem to be at a moment right now in American history where uh, many people are recognizing that diverse personnel can matter. So I think as a strategic matter, if you have to focus on legal change or personnel change, um, the wind will be in your sails if you focus on personnel change. Um, but uh, I'll still reserve my right to, to partially <laughs> punt on the issue and say they're both important. Sure, sure. They both can be important, but I think it's also uh, possible that law and legal change can sometimes just be symbolic, right? And uh, it looks like, uh, you know, we've done something, but if the folks who are enforcing it don't really view it as a priority, uh, we might not, not achieve what, uh, what, what it is intended to do. So that, I, I think this, this is a very important lesson. Um, I want to invite members of the audience, if you haven't already, uh, enter your questions and answer in, in the Q&A portion on your Zoom screen. Down at the bottom, there's a Q&A button, and you can type in your answer there. And we've got uh, questions in the queue that I'll be asking of Brian. Uh, next question, Brian, would be to ask about gender. You do include in your paper that uh, 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 you know, underlay your talk here, uh, you do include some uh, analysis of whether women on boards were, was associated with um, an increase on the CRA, Community Reinvestment Act scoring. Uh, but they, but but uh, the the variables for gender don't turn out to be statistically significant in the way that racial diversity is statistically significantly associated with the uh, increases in community reinvestment. Any explanation for these results? Yeah, so uh, we included it because uh, there are lots of studies showing that there is gender-based discrimination in lending, uh, particularly where uh, there is a, um, a, a single female borrower. So without a male co-borrower, 
uh, you see uh, higher rejection rates. Uh, and when credit is approved, it's usually approved on worse terms. Um, those, those are differences. There is gender discrimination. I wouldn't put it, I don't think any observer would put it in the same order of magnitude as uh, racial discrimination. Um, so uh, as a first cut, it, it makes sense that we do see more of an effect uh, for um, uh, increasing minority representation uh, than we do increasing um, a female representation. We were still a little surprised here. Um, I, I think maybe the explanation is uh, the CRA is um, a, a geography-based uh, statute. Um, lenders are supposed to um, invest in areas, uh, geographic areas, where they haven't before, where they tend to underinvest, as Professor Traunstein said in her lecture. Um, you do have racial segregation, uh, you don't have gender segregation. So it's really an imprecise tool. And I think the larger lesson here is diversity of all kinds is important, but it can't be a box checking exercise where, where different underrepresented groups are seen as interchangeable. And if the goal is to uh, increase lending to underserved uh, racial groups, it, it can't just be um, will, incre will increase diversity writ large. It, it really ought to be targeted uh, towards black and Hispanic uh, regulators. For, for the purpose of community reinvestment, certainly. Right, for that purpose. Yeah. And I, sh yeah. I should mention mm -hmm. there are other purposes as well where, um, mm -hmm. it, yeah. Yeah, and, and one, of the, one of the members of the audience asks about what might you have it by way of perspectives on including diversity along the lines of sexual orientation or gender identity. Yeah, so it would need to be targeted on, on the issue. And I think it's really, those are fascinating interests questions that are not on the radar, uh, frankly, of uh, people who work in financial regulation. So most of the evidence, the empirical evidence for uh, gender discrimination and racial discrimination in, in lending, well, for racial discrimination, it's like obvious to any historian or sociologist, but in, in, in terms of like contemporary discrimination by existing lenders, it comes from uh, disclosures that banks have to provide regarding everybody who applies for a loan. Uh, so, so you can see uh, the racial discrimination in that. You can see gender discrimination. Uh, they don't ask and they don't collect information on, um, on other categories like uh, gender identity or sexual orientation. Um, uh, the question makes me think they ought to. Um, and uh, that, that would be a, an easy change so that um, in the future, others can really calibrate uh, whether and to what extent a diversity on those uh, dimensions is, is useful as well. Uh, are there other kinds of measures that uh, you might look to beyond this community reinvestment scoring uh, that e even, even, even if it is just limited to racial and gender discrimination by banks, and we don't have the data yet on gender identity and sexual orientation, are there some other measures beyond the CRA scoring that might be used to, um, to determine whether diversity on Fed bank boards uh, matters, uh, to, to try to get some other kind of measure than what you have identified in your study? Yeah, so CRA scores are a blunt instrument. It's a proxy. You're not measuring the thing directly. You're measuring someone's assessment of the thing. And you're doing it on this four-point scale, which in practice is really a two-point scale uh, because almost all banks get a satisfactory or outstanding rating. Uh, yeah, so uh, one uh, possibility is uh, all these CRA exams, like the, um, the balance sheets of the banks, are all uh, published on uh, a federal government website. So somebody could um, could... could Clean that information, could scrape the PDFs, and actually see uh, precisely uh, loan amounts uh, to underserved areas. Uh, another possibility, and I alluded to this in my answer to the previous question, is uh, data that the federal government collects uh, concerning the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act. So this is every time somebody comes into a bank and asks for a home mortgage, uh, the, the outcome is recorded, what rate they're offered is recorded, um, uh, other terms of the mortgage, as well as a battery of descriptive characteristics. That's really useful because you, there you have data not only on the lending decisions that the banks made, but the decisions it didn't make. So who are they rejecting uh, versus with CRA scores, that's uh, kind of, a, it's an unknown. Um, so I, I hope this is, um, uh, I recognize the CRA is a blunt instrument and there, there's many ways to, uh, to analyze this more precisely. You think, uh, you know, to shift gears a little bit and focus on your your background in administrative law, uh, 
you've been focusing here on the implementation or enforcement of rules. Uh, you know, the, 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 the extent to which banks are sincerely and, uh, you know, earnestly carrying out their obligations under the Community Reinvestment Act. Would there, can you think of a way that this diversity might matter in the making of rules as well as in, 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 in their enforcement as you have here? Yes. Yeah, so um, the Federal Reserve System is a little bit of a black box concerning uh, rulemaking, but in other financial regulators, uh, there have been some really interesting studies uh, showing or uh, looking at the, the composition of folks that offer comments and particularly uh, the lengthy comments. Uh, this is uh, to back up when an agency wants to write a rule, they'll submit a, a notice and they'll collect comments and uh, they, uh, they have a legal obligation, uh, courts uh, will police, uh, whether their, um, uh, whether their um, uh, rulemaking decisions uh, take into account substantive comments. And the folks that tend to um, submit those substantive comments do tend to be uh, upper income, uh, do have, tend to be uh, trade groups, industry groups, uh, less so, and this is um, uh, not surprising, uh, with uh, other people that are affected. So um, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, um, when, when they're having a rate setting decision, uh, you have utilities and, and, um, uh, and other you know, big users of, of energy uh, commenting. It's very unusual for uh, an individual ratepayer to look at their electricity bill and say, I'm gonna talk to the FERC. Uh, um, the uh, FERC is now, um, uh, they just created this new office to, uh, to help rep represent those people's interests uh, and uh, even provide compensation um, in some cases. So uh, there are, you know, that's not targeted at race, but it is targeted at, at resources and, uh, and income. Um, so there are those sorts of measures that are just now coming online uh, concerning uh, rulemakings. I want to dig into some of your uh, statistical analysis for this paper. A, a, a member of the audience asks, how do you increase racial diversity in areas where racial diversity is low already in general? And this commenter in, from the audience uh, speaks as uh, the daughter of a small town or, or has a daughter of a small town banker uh, in, uh, in a state that's 97% uh, populated by people who are white. And you know, I guess it, it raises a question for your analysis too about whether what you're picking up in your statistical analyses is just a, really a, a, a kind of a spurious correlation where you have an underlying diverse population. There's more diverse professionals in the pool of potential Fed Bank Board members. There's also more opportunities to do an outstanding job yeah. of, of minority uh, lending or lending to underrepresented groups um, because there, there are more opportunities to do that kind of lending. Um, now, I know that you have one of your analyses in which you compare the, how the Fed Bank's diversity correlates take, compared with uh, in, uh, CRA scores when they're done by some other entity altogether. And that gives you some kind of, uh, I think, confidence that it's not just this underlying racial diversity. But um, I wanted, wondered if you, if you wanted to comment further on, on this kind of issue. How, how do you deal with this when you're, you've got banks and Fed bank boards that are in areas that may be uh, not diverse themselves? Great. So, uh, great set of questions. Um, so, on the the first uh, the question from the chat. Um, so, these are these twelve regions are, are large, and um, I, I think I would take a exception to the notion that there aren't qualified um, uh, Black and Hispanic bank executives and others who can serve on these positions. Um, even if you think uh, the states that have the lowest uh, minority uh, uh, populations. So, I'm thinking here of some of the Mountain West states. Um, uh, 
some New England states. These are in larger regions. So the Mountain West is grouped with California, which has a, a significant um, a Black and Hispanic population. Uh, we have uh, New Hampshire, Vermont, grouped with uh, Boston. There, there's a, a sizable Black professional class there as well. Um, so, so I think the pool is there. Um, uh, Carrie, on your related questions, so um, you know, how do we know this isn't just you know regions where people just care more about diversity? Those are regions where there's going to be a lot more um, reserve bank directors who are diverse, you know, and there's also going to be a lot better CRA lending. And I think um, you you alluded to I think part of my answer, uh, and if I could spell that out a little bit further. Um, we also look, there, there's another set of banks that are regulated by uh, other regulators. So the Office of Control of the Currency, the FDIC, uh, for part of our period, the Office of Thrift Supervision. And you would expect uh, for um, where you increase Federal Reserve Bank diversity uh, in those regions, you wouldn't expect to see a connection between increasing Federal Reserve Bank diversity uh, and better CRA scores by banks that are regulated by another agency. Uh, under my theory, if, if the Federal Reserve Bank diversity matters. If under your theory, um, it's just there's a culture where uh, diversity matters and uh, lending to underserved communities matters, and those things are just so intertwined, you would see, you would perceive a correlation uh, between um, increasing Federal Reserve Bank diversity and the CRA scores of non-Fed regulated banks. Um, maybe spoiler alert, you know, we don't see that connection. Uh, the other um, way we test it is, in uh, 2010, um, there was a change in law under which uh, three out of the nine members of each Federal Reserve Bank board uh, no longer played a role in the selection of the president of the Federal Reserve Bank board. So um, under my theory, uh, under our hypothesis rather, uh, that should matter. Before 2010, those three out of nine directors, um, diversity among those three should matter a lot for CRA lending. But after 2010, when the connection between those three and choosing the Federal Reserve Bank president and other officers is, is severed, it shouldn't matter at all. Um, and that's in fact what we find. Uh, you know, if instead it was just like, um, there's this uh, confounder where just a, a region's commitment to diversity and to, and to low-income lending were just uh, tied together, uh, you would still see that correlation persist after 2010. Uh, so the fact that we don't see it persist I think is some evidence uh, in, in favor of our view. And I say that with uh, appropriate uh, humility and, and uh, these things are so intertwined and there's, there's very few subjects that are as complex as race in America. Um, so uh, I am sure that there are causal arrows going every which way here. Well, I wanna thank you for uh, wading into the topic and, and looking for those causal arrows and contributing this uh, research and I urge any every member of the audience, if you haven't seen it already, to take a look at the, the paper that's available uh, in, in uh, Brian Feinstein's uh, uh, SSRN feed. I think you can find it there and on his website and on the Penn Program on Regulation website, you can find a link to it as well. Uh, I want to thank you very much for uh, joining us today, all of our audience members, and thank Professor Feinstein for this exceptional presentation today on an important subject that really connects well with uh, so many other facets of our focus this year. Again, many thanks, uh, Brian, for an outstanding presentation. Well, thank you, Carrie, and thanks to everybody for listening. Have a good evening.